Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is Anthony Magnabosco. Anthony, how are you doing today? And thank you for being here. Did I get the name right? You, yeah, you pronounced it perfectly, and thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here on your show. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. I have a brief bio on you, and then we shall get started with a deep dive. Anthony Magnabosco is from San Antonio, Texas, and is a founder and the current executive director of the nonprofit Street Epistemology International, SEI. SEI is an educational organization committed to addressing dysfunction in public and private discourse by encouraging rationality through civil conversation. SEI's goal is to provide people with the resources needed to develop, practice, and promote street epistemology, an approach that helps people critically reflect on the quality of their reasoning so as to update the confidence they have in their conclusions. Anthony has been involved with street epistemology since 2013 and has given dozens of talks and workshops at conferences and events both domestically and internationally. Many of his conversations have been uploaded to YouTube and demonstrate how street epistemology can be applied to a variety of claims, including those that are spiritual, political, or societal. Today, tens of thousands of people regularly practice street epistemology, the findings from which could very well help to solve the misinformation and disinformation crisis threatening humanity. And before we begin, if anybody wants to pause right here, go check out street epistemology on YouTube and watch a video and then come back, that might be wise, if you're not familiar with his work. Street epistemology, what is it and where do you do it? Oh, well, thanks for inviting me on your show and asking that really good question. And I'm glad that you made the plug to watch or check out an example online, because I think that that really drives it home better than any explanation that I might be able to come up with, but I'll try. So, so street epistemology is a different way of engaging with people on the claims that they tend to make because they think that they're true. Normally we tend to argue with people or give them facts or maybe even ridicule their position all of which doesn't help them take another look at their position. But if you engage with somebody where you're being civil, which can be hard to do on some of these subjects, I'm not going to lie, it can be very difficult. But if you're being civil and you ask questions to help your conversation partner reveal to you how they became convinced, it completely shifts the dynamic. So now you're working within your conversation partner's model of their belief. And they're revealing to you how they became so sure that, that, that they're correct. This is totally different than the way that we currently do it, where we argue with people, give them facts, ridicule them, like I mentioned. And the shift in approach where you're encouraging your conversation partner to reveal how they arrived, arrived at their conclusion tends to, keep, tends to keep people more open and less defensive and more reflective of the process that they use to arrive at their conclusion. And it's a really effective way, it appears, and we've been doing it for about 10 years now, more, more so, as you mentioned at the start. Uh, we've been doing it for a while, and we're, we're getting tons of feedback from people on the receiving end of these questions that it's completely changing the way that they thought about their initial claim, and it's changing the people who ask the questions. Uh, we tend to become a lot more um, understanding of people that we might disagree with and less reactive, which is something that I think we probably need in the world today more than ever. I must say, from watching the video, and before YouTube, I actually watched C-SPAN 2, Book TV, because they would have conversations there as well. And I must say there's, well, I find tremendous benefit to listening to how others reason, because you can follow along and say, oh, I do that too. So even if you don't participate as an active member, and you've never been uh, on street epistemology, watching the videos and just listening to how people think and how to explore your own thought processes, it's just super valuable. That's a really great point. A, a lot of people think, oh, this is something that I have to learn and do with other people in order to grasp the, the, the understandings of street epistemology. It's not the case. Like, it's helpful to learn it, but the process of you learning it, you begin to start applying uh, some of the, the thought processes, I suppose, of street epistemology on your own, your own self. So you're a lot more careful about the claims that you make in public and you're a lot more forgiving of people who might say something and you think, well, they, they probably misphrased that. This, this is a shift that tends to happen in the practitioner themselves, which makes us more responsible uh, communicators and responsible citizens. We're much more, I think, 
more careful about the things that we claim are true and then acting out on them is, is a little bit more reserved, I, I suppose. And that's a good thing. Like, so I would say uh, that that would be a really good benefit of learning street epistemology, even if you have no intention whatsoever of actually applying it and using it on some claim that somebody makes, it could benefit you tremendously. And as we go on here, I want to also say it took me a long time to learn how I had learned things and then realized that I actually hadn't learned a lot of things. I had been taught things, but being taught something, you don't always learn how it's done. So math, you're taught how to do math, right? Uh, you may be taught how to do music, but a lot of the facts and things we learn in school, they're taught to us and we repeat them back and we write them down. So we think we've learned them, but we really haven't explored them any. Um, so I don't want to, I'm not dragging on teachers here because I'm a music teacher myself and I've taught a lot of kids, hundreds of kids, <laughs> but the learning comes from the exploration they do on their own, um, if that makes any sense. So I'm not, not taking teachers down here because I know they have a lot of information to get to, but um, yeah, I think thinking about how we learn things is a good first step. <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing when, when we're engaging in a street epistemology conversation. We're walking through our conversation partners reasoning to their conclusion. And they may not even remember the reasoning that they used to get there if they were told it, like they were taught it as a kid. Or maybe they, I don't know, they read an article or somehow they acquired this information. And you're right, like we have all this information. We generally think that it's true, but rarely are we asked to to explain to ourselves and other people how we got there. How did you determine that that's actually a good thing that you think is true? Not, not a good thing, but how do you, how did you conclude that that's a, that's a correct thing? It's an accurate thing. It's a true thing that you believe. And those, that's when the questions start becoming a little bit more challenging. When we get to, down to those lower levels of, of an, a street epistemology conversation, we're, we're moderately, moderately interested in the what or the claim. Uh, and it's important to know what the claim is and, and the meaning of words and that type of thing. We're also interested in the why. That's sort of that mid-tier, like what are your reasons for thinking that this is true? And But it's this third level of the epistemology or the how did you determine that that's a good reason for thinking that your claim is true? What was your process? And a lot of people don't give much thought to the process. Usually the process is, well, somebody taught me this decades ago and I really haven't considered it much since. But I really, really think that it's true, and there's there's a there's a there's a potential for danger there, if you're acting out on beliefs that you're not exactly sure are true, and that that could really have profound uh, profound implications on society. If you have a if most of the population is walking around with untrue beliefs, it's going to be a problem, uh, and that's why I like street epistemology so much is that it what, what helps walk people through their reasoning, and realign their confidence in their conclusion to the quality of their reasoning. And usually there's a, there's a delta there. They're overconfident in their conclusion. And the end of the conversation, usually there's an aligning, uh, or at least maybe not even immediately, but maybe days later, weeks later, maybe even years later, as the person is processing this. Um, these things don't necessarily happen overnight. And it can, we'll come back to this, I hope, but it can be profound to realize that your teacher may have been wrong. It can be a mind blowing experience, but we may or come your back parents. to that. Or your parents, or your parents, well, like people that these people that raised me. They, I trust them. They they love me. They have they have my best interest in mind. However, I believe it because they told me that it's the case, and it's this profound thing that I've never explored. That's often a realization for a lot of people when they when they engage in these explorations. It's kind of a humbling process. It's humbling, but, it, but let's also reiterate: it doesn't mean your parents or your teachers were bad people. <laughs> If they Absolutely got something not. wrong and you and you took it on as a child, it's not, you know, okay. Yeah, I think we need to be forgiving of the people who give us this information because they likely haven't given it much thought either. They were taught it. And and street epistemology, I guess, sort of, it, it's a way of sort of interjecting in between those cycles of like, oh, hold on a second. Let's, let's walk, let's, let's remind ourselves how we became convinced that this is true. Can we walk through the reasoning behind it? And it's that discovery that, uh, oh, I don't have a reason, or the reason that I have is unreliable because anybody could have been taught this. You know, that, that those types of discoveries help people back off of their, their high levels of confidence. All right, I think we've laid some groundwork here, so let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, and 
I, I, I want to reiterate something that you said, and it's also in the in the opening that street epistemology is an approach that helps people critically reflect on the quality of the reasoning so they can update the confidence. So it's as you said here, it's not really about confronting people and literally trying to change minds. It's more it's about encouraging thinking and how one ri- arrives at a belief or what they think is true. Um, I, I think. Yes, yeah, sorry, please. And by the way, I don't always use these terms synonymously, but for purposes here, I'm sorry, for purposes here, I think when we say belief, truth, and I think that so, those are going to be synonymous. Although if you get deep philosoph- philosophically, they're not synonymous, but for I believe, or that's true, or I think, for right now, th- those are all synonymous. Yeah, I, I'd say so. I'd say a belief is something that you think is true. Um, there was another word that you threw in there that... Um, like truth itself is a whole other concept separate from belief as I see it. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, these, these words can get really complex. The important thing is when we're doing street epistemology is we tend to ask our conversation partner for the meaning of those words and then work within their model. But for the purpose of this interview, I think that those are good definitions. And if we want to refine it, we can do that later. All right. So let's get into some definitions because I'm big into definitions. So everyone knows what we're talking about um, right away. Just tell me, epistemology, what does that mean? In- well, epistemology, yeah. Well, epistemology is the study of knowledge or how we know the things that we claim to know. And it's a little bit of a, a misnomer when we use it in street epistemology because we're, we're not interested in what you know. We're interested in how you confirm that your reasons support your confidence that what you think is true is true. <laughs> and so there's there's a subtle difference there. Um, and that also the word street doesn't do us much, much help either. It usually gives the impression that you have to be on the street to initiate talks or, or, or become more epistemically humble yourself. And that's not the case either. Um, but yeah, so the, the word epistemology is... Um, is an academic term. It's a rather unfortunate term, but it's one that we're kind of stuck with. And I could just sum it up kind of in this way again for this conference, how we acquire knowledge, right? What method do we use? Sure. Yeah. The, 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 the process that a person used to arrive at their conclusions is, is maybe another way of putting it. Although I, I would think that there's probably some academic epistemologists that would disagree with that. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. But they're not here oh, today. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm they're sure they're not here today. There's got to be thousands and thousands of pages written on this. There's no doubt, but we have to come to some <laughs> agreement yeah. for you know, w- so people understand what we're talking about here. All right, um, and critically reflect. People say, "Oh, that's obvious," but what does critically reflect mean? I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, it's different than your regular kind of reflection. The, the type of reflection that we're talking about when somebody is critically reflecting is generally, it's generally after the recognition that. I have two competing beliefs in my head at the same time, and I'm not exactly sure which one is true. It's that sort of internal monologue or debate that's going on where, where you're, you're dealing with this tension. And I've always thought that this thing is true, but now I've got this other thing. And what do I do with that? How is this going to impact my life? Um, how can I find a better reason to be, become sure that what I thought was true is still true? Uh, that It's that type of reflection where you're, you're seriously pondering the impact of a change to your belief system might have on your life. <laughs> That's kind of what we mean by critically reflect, I think. It's that kind of deep reflection. Like think of the big decisions in your life, like who am I going to marry or what career am, am I going to take? What school should I go to? Th- those are, those are the, the big questions that we ask ourselves where we tend to put a lot of energy towards and think about it. That's the type of reflection that we're aiming for in an SE type of conversation. And it can be challenging to, to bring a conversation partner to that point, but that is the goal. We want our conversation partner to do the work and, and to do it in the most efficient way possible. And that's the critical reflection is what results in the recognition, perhaps, that maybe I'm overconfident in my conclusion, or maybe I'm underconfident, or maybe I'm in just the right spot. But it's that reflection on, on the relationship between my personal feeling of confidence and the truth of my claim and the recognition of the quality of the reasons that support that confidence. And it's that tension. It, that's, that's the critical reflection that we're aiming for is that, that internal thought. I think there are two, two great things you just said there. So update confidence in your conclusions. Um, 
It's not always, people might think that simply means reinforce what I believe. Um, but you may, when you're updating your confidence, it could, you could stay the same, you could feel more confident, but actually you could act, become less confident through critical reflection. Um, you sure and, can. And then the other thing you mentioned, making big decisions in life, who to marry, where to go to school, what career path to follow. If we have time, we can come back to that because that's something I'm interested in because there's, there's a link between critical reflection and maybe we never have enough information. So yeah, so emotion comes in there too. Mm, oh, yes. All right. So actually, some more. Beyond the bio, tell me a little bit more about yourself. So what were you doing before 2013? And, I mean, how did you come to street epistemology? Uh, what epistemology helped you think this was a good idea? Well, circa 2013, I was shuttering a business, a repair business that I had for mobile devices. Um, I was still a stay-at-home dad at the time and still, well, not so much anymore as my kids have moved out to college. But I was busy as a stay-at-home dad primarily, um, but shutting a small business down and then wanting to get into activism. I was seeing the harm that that magical thinking could cause on humanity. I was seeing it firsthand in my family and then also in, in my cities and in, in the broader world. So I wanted to do something. And then I discovered Peter Bogosian's book. It was called A Manual for Creating Atheists, which was really appealing to me at the time because I was having horrible conversations about religion and losing friends and family over it. And then when I switched to that model, the model of street epistemology, it improved my conversations. It made me feel better as a person. And I was making more progress exploring the claims that people make. So it was, it was just a perfect segue into something that I was really interested in and needed at the time. And it was, it was such in its infancy, nobody was putting videos out or anything like that. So then I thought, well, let me go out and just start recording some conversations where I'm, I'm, I'm practicing this approach of street epistemology. Let's see if it does anything. Does it really even work? So that's pretty much what I was doing back around that time was, you know, realizing that I was arguing with people about sensitive topics. Nothing seemed to be working. And there was this new way of engaging with people that maybe was better. And I just sort of threw everything at it because I thought, if this works, this is a total game changer for society. And I was really pleased to find out over the years that there really is something to it. If it could just catch on, if we can normalize it, if we can simplify it, if we can make it commonplace to, to ask a question or two about how you arrived at your conclusion in a civil way, it's a total game changer and it will help humanity. There's no question about it. So that's, that was, that's pretty much what I was doing around that time. And then for the last 10 years now, I've been involved in, in doing exactly that, recording conversations, giving talks. Uh, we started a nonprofit organization called Street Epistemology International, which you mentioned, to give people these tools to do it, to do it themselves. A manual for creating atheists. Um, so there's some baggage there, no doubt. <laughs> some baggage, yes. Because it's gone beyond. I mean, those are very difficult conversations to have. Great conversations about reasoning, though, um, but then apply it outside of that to uh, political views, societal views, uh, or anything, really, correct? Right. The, the, the guy that started it all focused his, his, put his focus on atheist activism for some reason, and that was appealing to me at the time because I was, you know, I, I wanted to talk to people about religion and, and in an effective way. But once I started doing it and other people started using this approach of asking questions that get down to the how we very quickly realized the the utility of it for all sorts of claims so it quickly shifted into supernatural claims like do ghosts exist and what do you think about aliens to political topics like you mentioned to social issues about trans rights and everything in between so it's a, it's a utilitarian tool. You can use it to explore any type of claim, but that was originally how it started. So there is some baggage there, particularly from, it's kind of, it's kind of unfortunate too, because there's so many people that they might hear the, the atheist origins of this thing and get scared of it, which is really unfortunate because it's such a wonderful tool for bringing us to the actual truth of the matter, I think. So it's unfortunate that it's been pigeonholed in that, but it, it, it's, uh, it's definitely expanded far beyond that. Can you take me through 
um, the rubric of good reasoning, if it's a rubric, I don't know, a, a chart of good reasoning. How, what's an, you know, how, how, what are some examples of good reasoning? And uh, again, we can think of it as th the way you do street epistemology, but it can also be applied to self-reflection of beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mention that because we're in the process of, we've developed a course for street epistemology. We have the first half done. We're working on the second half. And the part of the second half is to do exactly that, to outline what we mean by good, high quality reasoning. And uh, there's, there's a series of steps. Um, generally, a good reason is something that is clearly identifiable, that you can, you can clearly explain what it is without any confusion. It might be something that um, is testable. So like, could we actually run a, put, put this claim into a lab and run a test and determine if it's actually true or not? And what would, it, what would a test look like to show that it was false? That might be a good ca characteristic of a good quality reason. Um, a reason should also be something that is not impacted by biases, that you have the ability to recognize that you are being biased and mitigating for it. So like I, I may have believed something for the longest time, and because I believed it for so long, that's one of the reasons why I believe it. Um, some people might say that, like, well, I just believed it forever, and I don't have any plans on changing. Um, so, so I guess also like recognizing logical fallacies along the way. So they might say, well, I, I believe it for so long, or it's a part of my tradition, or um, so many other people believe this. So there's no, there's nothing wrong with me believing that it's true. It's the, it's the recognition and discovery of logical fallacies along the way, and then to trying to account for those. But these are a lot of things that we're not taught how to do this normally. I, I don't know of many children that are taught this in schools to do these things, to, to learn how to become a, a more critical thinker or a better reasoner. And we're sort of bumbling through life. And um, I'm hopeful that from the things that we've learned from using street epistemology for the last decade over the world, you know, across the world for the last 10 years, um, I'm hopeful that we can boil this down and make it into a, an educational component so that we're teaching people from the start how to reason better as opposed to after the fact learning that I didn't reason properly and now I have to untangle this web of, of beliefs that I have. I think it was referenced to me once a little bit ago that there's no doubt that schools will have to teach this as part of media literacy because I didn't have the internet when I was a kid. I had to go to the library, look something up in the encyclopedia, and those were assumed to be reliable sources. Now students can just look things up. I don't know if it's internet literacy or whatnot. You'll ha they, they'll have to teach some critical thinking, critical reflection skills to make sure that students understand that what they're getting has been reasoned out. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've, I don't know if you talked with uh, Melanie Trace at King yes, yet. Yeah, she, she's been on. Yes, yes. okay. Right, she's got the, it's, it's Thinking is Power is, is their website, and it's great. Um, I think that's one of their, her goals is to teach people youngsters how to reason better and to discern uh, false information from from the truth that's the biggest challenge of our time that is absolutely the biggest challenge of our time if you don't mind let me get a little personal here what have you changed your mind about and what i mean something big like maybe it's aliens or i don't know something big that that you thought through and said wow you know i really wasn't thinking about this correctly it was just something i always assumed to be true and i mean anything that rocked your world there were a few things over the years. Uh, the most prominent one that comes to mind is living in Texas. There's been this big push to allow people to open carry weapons. So over the last 10 years, and I think they finally passed the law where you don't have to have any training whatsoever. You don't need to have a, a, a permit. You can just get a gun, put it on your hip and go to the grocery store. And I just, that's even just saying that out loud today is like, what, what a stupid thing. I was really against that idea until I started using SE with people who were for that idea because I wanted to challenge them. I thought this is a real problem. Being in my school and seeing a woman two steps ahead of me in line at the school uh, with a gun on her hip, it's, it's a very disconcerting kind of uh, image. So, but I, you know, I started using SE with people. At, I would go to protests and I would talk to these gun uh, open carry advocates and I would engage with them and ask them questions. And my intent with asking the questions was to help them reflect on their own reasoning. That's what we try to do, right? We want to get to that point of critical reflection. Um, but 
at the same time, I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm also entertaining the things that they're saying. So I find myself shifting and being a little bit more open to the idea of open carry in Texas. But I'm not 100% sure on it. Like I, I'm, you know, maybe like a, at a 65 or a 70 that I think it's a good idea. Um, but um, that, that's something that I've changed on. And there, there have been a few things over the years. That's what tends to happen when you do SE. It, you, you tend to reevaluate all your beliefs and ideally align them to the, to the quality of the evidence that you think that you have. And I've done that for most all my beliefs. And, and um, a lot of people in the SE community, I would say, probably have that tendency. You know, we're a little bit more careful about what we claim to know to be the case. I don't mean to get off on this, but what, what, what's, can you give me what the best reason that someone shot back at, so that's a great metaphor, gave, um, I guess, yeah, shot back at you that helped you move up to 65, 70%? It was response time. So there, 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 there was an incident at that school, the woman with the gun on her hip, if she wasn't that person, um, she would have a lot quicker chance to respond to a shooter in that school if, if we had to like suddenly rush outside and start dialing for the cops to show up and wait five minutes. So, so that was somewhat compelling to me. But listen, I'm not 100% there. I, I still don't like the idea. Yeah, I still don't like the idea. But that is something that I shifted on before I was like, I, I was a, you know, I, I didn't did not like it It needed to be shut down. But I've, I've definitely opened my mind on it a little bit. Well, how do you think about or respond to a bad reason that's used for or, or accomplishes good results. All right. So maybe I, I have no justification, but it makes me feel better to believe X. So I'm getting something right. personally good out of it. I don't want to think about it. So that's, that's a topic in and of itself. And we have those a lot. So sometimes we'll set aside the claim. Like I think ghosts are real. And somebody might say, well, it's nice to think that I'm going to see my loved ones again. And they're, they're coming down and drinking water. And, you know, I leave water out for the spirits of them. And it's a nice feeling. It makes me feel good to think that that's true. So we do get that that's common. Uh, but what we, what we'll tend to usually do is then shift the discussion to talk about the, uh, the value of truth. Yeah. Do you value truth generally? Like, are you consistent in that? Would you, are you across the board? As long as it feels good, you, you prefer the benefit of the belief over the truth of it. So, like, if your doctor said that you were sick and you should take this medicine, would you would you discount her advice because you, you don't care about the truth of it and you'd much rather be happy? So you can you can explore that uh, truth valuation and how people see the word truth is a huge factor when it comes to exploring people's reasoning. And sometimes you have to set aside the claim and, and go after these larger um, issues that are at play there. But yeah, there, there are many people who say, I'd, I'd much rather believe that it's true as long as it's not hurting me or anybody else. I'm, I'm fine believing it. There's a wonderful conversation on my channel with a woman named Maritza, M-A-R-I-T-Z-A. And the first one is, is, is exactly about that. We talk about truth. And then she ends up shifting after a 20 minute talk. Like, you know, I, I guess maybe it is more important for me to believe things that are true, even though, even though it might be painful to, to come to that discovery. It was a really wonderful moment. And then she came back a couple of weeks later and we had a second talk about spirits and ghosts and leaving out water for them. Um, so yeah, sometimes you have to take a little bit of a detour to get back to the actual belief at hand. Okay. I'd never heard about leaving water out for ghosts. So I'll have to look that up. <laughs> Just because that yeah. itself sounds fascinating. So you've been doing this for a long time. So you're probably pretty cool, calm, and collected when you engage in these conversations. But I'm wondering if you think back, have you had difficulty remaining objective? I mean, in continuing with the conversation, centering on investigating the belief as opposed to becoming involved with the end result and trying to refute reasons and lead the interviewees in a direction? I mean... I assume someone has made a claim that you thought was complete baloney and the reasoning as well, right? So do you hide that? Do you talk about it? Uh, great question. And this is a hotly contested issue in street epistemology circles. What should we reveal to our conversation partner about our own position? When I first started doing SE, if I thought that their claim was silly or I thought that they were obviously wrong, I would usually hold back my view and not share it with them because I didn't want to upset them 
I didn't want to distract from the exploration of their own belief, right? Because I'm, I'm not there to pu push my point of view. I'm there to understand how they arrived at theirs. But invariably, people would want to know where I stood. And I used to say, well, I'll tell you after the after the timer goes off, because I would set a timer for five minutes or something, or yeah, it's not important. You know, I'm really here more to talk about you than me. And they would, they would usually be fine with that. But what I didn't realize is that it, it, it had the potential of giving viewers the impression that I was hiding my view. So now when people want to know where I stand on their claim, I will share it with them almost instantly. Yeah, I don't think that that's true, but I'm fascinated to find out how you became convinced that it's true. Now, sometimes people, they, they won't be willing to go with you. They want to know why you don't think it's true. And they start, what tends to happen is people then start giving you reasons that they will, that they think you will find convincing. They now start to make the case for why you should also believe what they believe, which is different than exploring the reasons that they found convincing. Think about it. Like so many times. Let's say you run into somebody that you disagree with. You want you give them the reason that you think they'll that 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 will change their mind, and um, that's what tends to happen when you share your own views. Which is again not what that's not the direction that we're trying to go. I want to work within your belief system and get down to your reasoning, and don't worry about what I have here. But um, all that being said, I do think it is important to share your view if you're asked. You can even volunteer it and say. You know, if at any point you want to know where I stand on your claim, feel free to let me know. I, I, I'm a little worried that it might bias the conversation and maybe make make you more defensive and maybe shift gears to the point where you're not wanting to convince me. You can lay everything out on the table, what your concerns are, and then you can leave it up to them to see if they want to know where you stand or not. So you can say, you know, I must say I disagree with your claim, but I really want to find out your reasoning and how you came to it so I can understand where you came from and learned something myself. That would not Precisely. be, that would not be, uh, what do you call it? Um, it would be disarming. Yeah, um, they probably wouldn't get riled up be, as, as a result of that. Uh, sometimes people do though. Like they, they, you'll notice it like, boom, the second I reveal that I disagree with you, their arms cross or they took a step back or they cocked their head. They're like usually there's some sort of, um, and this is for face-to-face -face conversations, but yeah, generally people, it shifts the dynamic when people realize that you're not on the same page with them. And that can get in the way of exploring their reasoning. And I want to clarify here, it's something I often do, so I'm just going to do it with you too. Um, I think that we're all, I mean, we're having this conversation together about other conversations you've had with other people, but we've also talked about something you changed your mind about. But I, I want to say that we are all susceptible to bad reasoning depending on the circumstances, right? So this is not the other person. This is not for always, this is not always someone else's problem. Use these techniques to self-reflect. There are a lot of bad reasons to believe things that we just don't know. And even some of them are simple that have been explored for years now, like eyewitness testimony. People just believe they saw what they saw. Um, it's, or I guess an outrageous one would be my, my grandmother was abducted by Bigfoot because, I don't know, she's missing and there are big tracks outside. I mean, so someone can have a sincere belief that we think is laughable, but so could we. <laughs> if that's we fair. are in the same, it is fair, we are in the same boat as everybody else. And even though you might have learned some great tools for critical thinking and, and you're great at generating cr cr critical reflection in others, um, and hopefully yourself, like, yeah, we, we are in the exact same position. There's likely many, many beliefs that I have at the moment that I'm acting out on and I'm acting out on beliefs that are not true. And I don't want to do that. I want to identify as many beliefs that are not true and quarantine them and lower my confidence in them. And that is, that is really my goal. And, but it's not necessarily the goal of everybody they run into. As we mentioned before, there might be people who they value the practicality of the belief and, and the benefit of the belief over the actual truth of it. They don't really care if it's true or not as long, long as they're getting value on it. How do you respond to criticism such as that you say you're trying to get people to think about it, but really you are trying to get them to change their beliefs? You're not really trying to get them to self-reflect. You're trying to get them to, I mean, look at the ma a manual for creating atheists, right? That's where this started. So right there, you, that's a sh you're trying to get people to change their beliefs. Yeah, that's, that's always going to be the charge. And there are people that will gravitate towards SE tools to use it to that end. 
Uh, there's one guy in particular, he's a, he's an activist for veganism. He's discovered SE tools and he goes out to change people's minds about eating meat and he'll use these tools for that end. So you actually, you can use street epistemology for that. There are some, I guess you would say purists who would say, no, you should really be asking these questions to g genuinely understand and provide the clearest vision into how your conversation partner is reasoning to them so that you can leave them alone then so that they can decide what they want to do with that. Okay. So th somebody might say, you know, this, this guy asked me all these questions. I'm now contemplating the quality of my reasoning and I'm not exactly sure that I can be this, this sure that it's true. And, and that's, t that's generally the, where we tend to leave people where they are now then left to, to do whatever they want to with that information. They may go out to find better reasons, or they may actually lower their confidence or they may curl up in a corner because it was too it was such a shocking discovery. I mean, you, you don't know what the reaction is going to be of these type of, types of conversations. But my hope is that people who discover SE don't take advantage of the 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Not sensitivity, but your your the vulnerability that a person is in when they're in that critical moment of reflection. Because that is a prime opportunity to slip in something that you think they're going to find convincing and you've just imparted your idea. But another part of this, there's a side project to SE and it's giving people the tools so that they can think critically and they can actually reason better themselves. So slipping in a belief that um, that wasn't properly reasoned is one of the last things you want to do. I don't want people to come to my point of view because I've tricked them into it or they were in a vulnerable moment and now they've, they've adopted my belief. I want people to arrive at their beliefs because they have good reasons and they can back them up to themselves. We, we don't want to be tricking our conversation partners to our own conclusions. We want them to reflect on how they arrived at theirs and then leave them alone to decide of what they want to do with that. You, you just made me think about something here. And I know you mentioned earlier that um, you had a conversation with a woman and she came back a couple of weeks later. I imagine that happens uh, frequently. Have you considered when you're engaged in these conversations, if it's something, uh, I guess would say spiritual or supernatural, and you're speaking with someone, have you seen them change and start uh, dangerous isn't the word here, but melt a little bit. Like their worldview could change, and it can be it could be a profound emotional um, reaction. Have you seen that happen in real time? I have in real time, not in real time. Not not. I don't. I don't think there's ever been a moment in a conversation where somebody number one recognized that they were overconfident and had some sort of breakdown in front of me. That, that existential crisis, that sort of be existential crisis. Now, yeah. I have had reports where there was one guy, uh, I have two videos on my channel, his name is Austin. Um, and he was, uh, he was a religious like um, proselytizer. He worked for one of these on campus Christian ministries promoting religion and we ended up talking. And then I, he told me, he messaged me afterwards that after the second talk, he went to the bathroom and started crying. I think he had some sort of breakdown and then he, he reached out to his friends. So, you know, when you get feedback like that, it, it dawns on you of the seriousness of these types of questions for a lot of people that you, you really could be completely capsizing their entire world with some of these questions. So you have to tread very carefully. That's why I've never liked making jokes about street epistemology or using salacious clickbaity titles and that type of thing. Because it's kind of a serious business when you're when you're exploring people's reasoning on beliefs that are closely tied to their identity, and it impacts how they react in the world and who they surround themselves with. And if you challenge that, it's 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 huge. It's massive. So you have to be very careful with how you go about doing it. Especially in the case that you just related. I mean, I can under, assume that that person had an entire social structure built around this belief system, yes. whatever it was that they had, and to then start right. to question it and then not be able to resolve it. Yeah. And th that might be the extreme. Like there, there, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, there have been people that I ran into a year later 
who said, um, thank you for that conversation. It got me started on a journey and I don't believe it anymore. Of course, it's always at the back of my mind, like, okay, so, but is their belief really true or not? Like, did they just become less confident in a belief that's really true? <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you, you kind of have to go with it. But yeah, for the most part, o- overwhelmingly, the feedback that I've received from people that have been on on the receiving end of these questions has been positive. They they enjoy it. They thought it was productive. They want to have other people that they know go through it and do it themselves. Or they even better, they want to learn it and then use it on the claims that I make. That's the total success where they've not only reflected on the claim, one particular claim that you happen to be exploring, but they saw the value in the, in the process and they wanted to learn it and use it or teach other people. Let's go back to reasons versus emotions, which sort of came up uh, several minutes ago. Uh, reasons versus emotions in decision making. And I, you said something and I started to talk about it and then we put it on the back burner. So let's get to that burner now. So I wonder if you agree with this or if you've seen it play out that you know, one aspect to people thoroughly examining the, a deeply held belief is that they may find out that the belief doesn't hold up to reason. And as we just said, you know, that can be disturbing, right? Um, and in such cases, emotion can override reason, right? Like, I, I can't justify it, but it's something I've always held on to, so it's part of me. I just, I just can't let this belief go. Have you been, that's one aspect of it. Have you heard that before? I get your reasoning and I'm not doing it right, but you know, it's just, it's just, it's just who I am. I need it. I've had that. Okay. There's one video in particular that comes to mind. I don't remember the fellow's name, but again, it was about religion. And I think it was, he was basically saying, listen, I've got too much going on in my, in my life right now with school that I can't really seriously question these beliefs that I've been raised with. I'm just not ready to do it at this time. So you, sometimes you get, you get uh, some feedback like that, but yeah, I try, I try to go where my conversation partners take me. If, if a person's willing to like honestly explore the quality of their reasoning, we're off, we're going. But sometimes you get an indication that it might be too difficult to, for them or they're not ready for it yet. And that, that should be an indication that you should probably change the, change the subject or explore a completely different claim. Or if you want, you can explore the claim that he's not ready for it yet. Well, what would it look like for you to be ready? When would you be ready? What would need to happen in order for you to be ready to explore this? You can be, you can be talking in a meta kind of way about about the discussion. Um, street epistemology ultimately is is a meta, it's a it's a meta cognition dialectical. We're engaging in this conversation for you to take a step back and and really observe your own reasoning, and then ask if I'm cool with this to my satisfaction. Uh, but not everyone's ready to do that. The second aspect is uh, when you're talking about career, who to marry, what school to go to. Um, that's something when I think about it, like the facts are never in, no matter how much reasoning we do. I mean, it's very difficult to make those kinds of decisions, right? So what do you do when you're, can, reasoning can go in a circle, right? So I mean, you know, especially with schools, right? There's a lot of good, good and bad things to every school or a career. I mean, or, you know, what's the difference between a Toyota uh a Camry versus a Honda Accord versus a Hyundai. I mean, eventually, sometimes we we have to make an emotional decision, right? It leads. It does come down to emotions. Well, uh, yeah, street epistemology is really good about recognizing when emotions are a reason. We we specifically look for psychosocial motivations behind people's justifications for thinking something is true. It's one of the few tools that are out there that I'm aware of that actually does that. So we are very interested in, in, uh, the psychology behind these beliefs. Um, we would love it if a conversation partner said something like, uh, yeah, I don't really care if this is true or not, but I get a lot of value from thinking that it is. It makes me feel better that it's the case. That's a whole great conversation that you can explore. It doesn't mean the conversation's over. Um, but generally I think, the more that you learn about street epistemology and the more you realize how your emotions do bias you, they bias the beliefs that we have often away from the actual truth of it. And it's accounting for those biases and and, um, mitigating them as well as our emotions that tends to make for a, I don't know, a more reasonable society, but you can't just uh, like emotions. Emotions are really tough. Like, 
the, the emotions that people are experiencing are real. It's just the claims that the people are making that people make are not necessarily real. So you have to deal with the emotions as you untangle those claims. The Street Epistemology website, you have a whole course there now. So what's going on with SEI International? I'm sorry, SEI is Street Epistemology, Street Epistemology International. So what's going on there moving forward? Oh my gosh, we have so many things going on. Well, number one, we just recently made, a, made a, an announcement to the community of how we're going to better manage examples of street epistemology so that we can better delineate between experimental versions of street epistemology and more polished versions of it. Because there's a perception now that's being out there that's, that's, uh, that's you know, always challenging to sort, sort of market and manage that. But with regards to the course, we've compiled a team of, I think at, at our peak, we probably had 20 people on the team from around the world developing a course on street epistemology. We literally asked the community, what are some topics that we should have in this course? And then we found experts in street epistemology who were willing to work on this project for the last three years and construct this wonderful self-directed course that it gives the definition of street epistemology. It explains the why somebody would want to use it. What, what would be somebody's objectives? Uh, object, what would be somebody's goals or objectives to want to learn street epistemology? How do you actually do it? And how do you, how do you overcome some of these challenges that we encounter, like psychosocial motivations or somebody doesn't value truth? That's all covered in this course. So you can go online right now at navigatingbeliefs.com and sign up for the free course. We've got the first half of the course done, and we expect to have the second half of the course done by the end of this year. So streetepistemology.com, navigatingbeliefs.com, those will lead you in the correct direction. Not the correct That's direction, right. but those, if you're interested in what we're talking about here, those will lead you to more information. Yeah, if you go to streetepistemology.com under, there's a link at the top that says course, and then you'll find the link to the course. There's a whole bunch of information out there, links to playlists, links to communities, other resources. And when you say tens of thousands of people across the world, um, yeah. that sounds like you could run into somebody anywhere. Um, down, so I'm in Boston. I could hit somebody, hit not hit. I could run into somebody down here in Boston Common with a little clipboard and a sign practicing street epistemology. Or uh, more than more than likely, I, I'd say there's probably a dozen people across the United States that have gone out recently. Probably way more, maybe several dozen. Uh, there's one fellow in particular. He's driving around the country, the United States, and he's stopping in different cities and he's meeting with people who are sort of on the fence about doing street street epistemology and he's sitting up setting up a table with folks and and going around but um I, I wouldn't judge the success of street epistemology by the number of people doing it in public like we want people to just use this in their daily lives when their kid is afraid that there's a monster under the bed that's a perfect opportunity to explore their reasoning if you're at work and you're deciding where to put your next warehouse well you might want to you can ask these questions of the people who are bringing these decisions to you to respectfully explore and challenge how they arrived at their conclusion. So the, the, the main goal of Street Epistemology International is to normalize and simplify the tools so that we can work them into society so that we're just, we just naturally do this and we'll look back and wonder how, what do you, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean we argued and provided facts to people? That's clearly not the way to go. We want to normalize this other approach. And I like what you just said, don't measure by the number of people doing it because really you can do this yourself self-reflection or uh, with your kids or whatever. That's what the point Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Even if you learn this and you never used it with anybody else but yourself, that is still beneficial because you're going to notice the changes in the claims that you make. And you'll notice how you react when you hear claims that you disagree with. You'll probably become a lot less triggered by them and you'll probably be more curious and you'll probably be wondering, how did they get there? And I wonder if they're around and willing to talk with me about it because we can explore it together with them. All right. Anthony Magnabosco, streetepistemology.com, navigatingbeliefs.com. Tons of information there. And also go to YouTube and just put in street epistemology, watch a four or five minute video. You'll get the idea and you will, I, as I said before, it's beneficial to think about how you would react in that situation as the claimant, you know, go through your own reasoning. So... I greatly thank you for being here. I think this has been a great conversation. Thank you for having me on your show and bringing, bringing these tools to other people because 
there's a lot of false information out there. There's a lot of people that are, that want to take advantage of us, and it's important to have have these tools. So thank you for having me on. You're welcome. Streetepistemology.com. Thank you. <laughs>